pretty amazing crowd. Thanks everyone for coming out to join us. My name is Kieran Ahuja. I'm the executive director of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I've uh, officially been in my job for about one year. And uh, uh, just a little bit about me, um, I actually have no business experience whatsoever. So I think I'm really very qualified to be here in this role. Um, well, my background actually is doing litigation, civil rights litigation, uh, running a women's organization. Um, and, and that's interesting because in a lot of ways my job is about being a generalist as an executive director. Uh, the White House Initiative is housed in the Department of Education, but we work across uh, more than 23 federal agencies in the federal government to increase access and participation for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders um, within the federal government. Uh, so we work on issues from health, education, the environment, uh, uh, community development and housing, and in particular, economic development, uh, which is why we're here and why this particular summit is so important and why we wanted to start in Silicon Valley. Um, of course, uh, Delauer was uh, wringing our arms to do it here, which didn't take much, but um, there is the great importance of what you're doing here uh, and the fact that there's a lot to talk about with what the administration has been doing around entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, we have a, a, an incredible group of esteemed panelists here uh, with a lot more experience than I do, uh, and which I'm glad because I can let them take some of the hard questions later on. Uh, but I, I was thinking about this as far as, well, you know, I don't necessarily have the business background, um, but thinking about entrepreneurs and then the, the piece about entrepreneurial spirit, right? I was like, I think I have a little bit of the entrepreneurial spirit. So I had to think back to when I was, you know, really in touch with that. And you know, I have to say I had to go back all the, all the way to when I was on my bike pedaling around the neighborhood selling Girl Scout cookies and trying to make uh, uh, you know, whatever top ranking uh, in, you know, Girl Scout uh, with um, um, selling those cookies. And then thinking also about my parents uh, and, and about our families. Uh, uh, you can talk about entrepreneurs, high-tech entrepreneurs here, the number of entrepreneurs per square mile in this region. Um, but the entrepreneurial spirit is a part of the Asian American community. And um, if we think about our parents and, and uh, uh, the kinds of jobs and um, what they were doing uh, when they came to the country, whether it was second, third, fourth generation at this point, my parents who came um, as first generation immigrants, uh, my mom, uh, uh, for various economic reasons, um, had to become the, uh, the small business owner, the, uh, the entrepreneur in our family, um, from being a real estate agent to an insurance agent to uh, uh, running um, a clothing store at the time when I was high school, which I thought sold very tacky clothes <laughs> that I didn't want to find myself anywhere near. But um, of course, that was the time when you're um, in, uh, in high school and didn't want to have to do anything with your parents. But um, so you know, I think it's uh, very telling about the connection that we have um, in our communities. Uh, uh, with the entrepreneurial spirit and the entrepreneurs that we have in this room, um, and that uh, even though they're very different, whether you talk about your parents running a dry cleaner or um, a convenience store or a motel or, or clinics or like my mom who ran a clothing store, um, it's all a part of a continuum of what we're trying to do, which is uh, do what we can do best for our families and for uh, our communities and for our country. It's all tied together, and so I just feel so privileged to be here and so privileged to um, be a part of this discussion. So I will uh, not waste any time um, in introducing uh, the esteemed uh, panelists on, um, uh, for this morning's plenary. And the morning plenary is entitled, Ways in Which Government is Working to Help You. So we have, uh, first off, is Ronnie, Ronnie Chatterjee, um, to the very far end, and he is serving as senior economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors. And he focuses on entrepreneurship, small business, and innovation policy. And uh, Professor Chatterjee, as he's known, 
Can I just call you Prof? Yeah, that's okay, fine. Okay, thanks. Um, is on leave from Duke University School of Business, uh, where he uh, was an associate professor of strategy. He, his work investigates some of the most important forces shaping our global economy and society around entrepreneurship, innovation, and the expanding social mission of business. Um, he was also advisor for the Duke's program for entrepreneurs and was an entrepreneurship teacher at a Durham Public High School when he was down there. So he was very, very busy. Um, uh, we also have Elizabeth Eccles, who is the regional administrator of the U.S. Business Administration. Uh, very recent appointment in August, so she's more of a newbie than I am. Uh, Ms. Eccles, though that does not, no indication of the level of experience that she brings, of course. Uh, Ms. Eccles oversees SBA's program services and 120 employees throughout Region 9, and which encompasses California, Nevada, Arizona, Hawaii, Guam, and the U.S. territories in the Pacific Islands. Um, she, uh, SBA plays a leading role helping small business owners and entrepreneurs, securing financing, technical assistance, training, and federal contracts. And as a part of SBA's economic recovery efforts, Region 9 has backed more than 11,000 re Recovery Act loans worth nearly $6 billion. She is also a strong advocate for innovation, sustainability, and economic development. Um, she served as director of the Northern California chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council, where she focused on developing public policy and forging alliances to support green jobs. And she also served as director of policy at Google. And she's very passionate about providing opportunities to the youth and underserved markets, and also spent some time uh, uh, in in. Um, in, a, in, in Washington um, as a part of the Clinton administration. And finally, we have Don Graves, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Small Business, Community Development, and Housing Policy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. In this role, uh, uh, Mr. Graves manages a portfolio of policies, policy issues including business and small business finance and development, housing finance, community and economic development, capital access, job creation, and issues related to underserved communities. Um, I'd like to also say that he was involved in the White House initiative during the Clinton administration, uh, which is a little bit of the history of the initiative that we uh, were actually originally started during the Clinton administration. So it's great to have him involved with us as well uh, during the Obama administration. Um, uh, Don also served as partner with Graves, Horton, Askew, and Johns, and um, has also served as uh, director of public policy for the Business Roundtable. And finally, in addition to the work um, as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Small Business Community Development and Housing Policy, he also oversees the newly created Small Business Lending Fund and State, business, and state Small Business Credit Initiative. Um, finally, I just wanted to mention about Don that uh, he actually is, uh, just from the base on his volunteer work, uh, is very committed to uh, taking his business skills and the work that he's done to helping um, underserved communities. Um, and I think that says a lot about um, the character of who he is and, um, and the kinds of individuals, of all the panelists that we have here, of the kind of individuals we have in our administration. So um, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Ronnie, Professor, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Professor Chatterjee. R Ronnie's uh, by, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> To get us started, thank you. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. This is a fantastic uh, crowd. It's really a credit. I mean, standing room only here. So a credit to Kieran and the initiative and her entire team. And I just, I'm really pleased to be here, and I want to thank you guys for, for showing up. Um, for me personally, it's great to be back in the Bay Area. I spent five years at Berkeley, and during those five years, we, uh, we used to play football against a school down the road here. I can't remember the name of it, but we, we, we did win five consecutive times during my uh, tenure. That's it. <laughs> so go Bears, and I will, uh, I will I'll, I'll pretend I don't hear the boos from the Stanford uh, crowd over here. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, this year was a little bit different. <laughs> but let's talk about the future. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the theme of my talk, really, is about the future. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about the future of the big game at the end, too. So in my role at the President's Council of Economic Advisors, um, I try to advise Austin Goolsby, who's our boss, on entrepreneurship, innovation, and small business policy. 
And I thought today what I'd like to do is just give an outline of where the economy is and where we're going. I'll leave the description of the detailed programs to the competent panelists to my right. But I'd also like to just talk a little bit more broadly about the role of innovation and entrepreneurship in economic growth. Because really we're turning a corner in so many ways. And the next several years are going to be about the people in this audience and audiences like this all around the country and the new products, the new companies, and what you can contribute. And I'd like to focus on that near the end of my talk and then uh, I really look forward to your questions and hopefully I can catch up with as many of you guys afterwards as well. So first thing is we had pretty good news this morning. When I read my BlackBerry, it was buzzing from pretty early on and our private sector job growth today was 113,000. That's 12 months of private sector job growth. It's the best year that we've had since 2006. Unemployment rate went down to 9.4%. So there was some good economic news, but as the President stresses and Austin stresses in all their remarks, it's not good enough. We're starting to turn the corner. The recovery has some momentum, but we need to take the next step. And I think today's news was just yet another positive signal that lets us know, in addition to small business optimism, consumer spending upticks, that we need to keep the momentum going, we need to keep the pressure on, and we can't let up. These positive signs should encourage us to go forward. You know, this recent economic good news might make us forget a little bit about where, where we were. We were really facing the most serious economic downturn since the Great Depression. The biggest economic challenge that we've had in my lifetime and hopefully, you know, for the rest of my life. And the President took a lot of bold action during that time. And he started with the Recovery Act. So I just want to go through a few things that we did in some of the major pieces of legislation to deal with that period. And then I want to start to talk about turning the corner. So the Recovery Act, as you guys know, was a mix of tax cuts. It was a mix of aids to, aid to states. It was about investments in infrastructure and innovation. All told, when the numbers were added up, the Recovery Act has saved or created millions of American jobs. Those are the facts. So it was incredibly successful, and it came at a time where we were really risking going into a negative spiral, and now we stabilize the economy. That was the first thing, and I think a big victory for the Recovery Act, a cornerstone of all our efforts that came after that. The next thing that you might not have heard as much about, that I'm sure Don will talk a lot about, and Elizabeth will talk about, is the Small Business Jobs Bill. The Small Business Jobs Bill was another interesting and important set of legislative proposals. The biggest ones I want to focus on are the eight tax cuts that we gave to small business. You might not hear that uh, in the press. You might not see that. We've cut, tax, we've cut taxes for small business 16 times. We've accelerated $55 billion in tax cuts for small businesses. Those are the facts on those issues. And the Small Business Jobs Bill was a cornerstone, both increasing access to credit, also setting up the Small Business Lending Fund that Don oversees. And those are really important programs I hope uh, people in the audience take advantage of. Healthcare is probably something you guys might have heard a little bit about too. I, I don't know if it really made much news last year. But the healthcare legislation, one of the things you might not have heard of was that they had a 35% tax credit against premiums for entrepreneurs and small business owners. We also made it easier for self-employed people to deduct health insurance expenses from their taxes. We know that starting a business is hard enough without worrying about affordable health care. We took several steps in that direction as well. The last thing I want to talk about on the legislative calendar was the recent tax deal. I think people here might be familiar with the tax deal that was cut in a lame duck session. Again, the facts on this are pretty clear. We got a payroll tax cut for 155 million Americans. That's a huge swath of the American people. We got 7 million people who continued their unemployment benefits while they're looking for a job. 7 million is a big number. It might be hard to comprehend. But if you know one person who's on unemployment insurance, you know how vital that program was as well. And that's in addition to extending the loans to, in clean energy to keep jobs and solar and wind, many of them in this area, going. That's in addition to keeping middle class tax cuts uh, in place. Now, of course, it came at a cost. Everyone knows uh, the costs. But this president wasn't willing to let the middle class be caught in the crosshairs of partisan bickering. And that's why we got the deal we did. So when you look back at all the actions we've taken, and that, there's many. I just tried to highlight a few of those. You look at an economy that was really facing a downward spir spiral. The president managed to turn it around, and now we've stabilized it. But the question is, what comes next? And I think that's the question that I think people in this audience are going to be most interested in. Where's economic growth come from? And when I think about the biggest economic question of our time, it's going to be where are those new industries going to be? And where are those new jobs going to come from? And I think if I look across this audience, I think I'm looking at the people who are going to produce those right now. So how are we going to lay that infrastructure down? So let me talk a little bit about the administration's innovation strategy as well. So the first thing we did in the Recovery Act that I thought was key was we focused on energy. ARPA-E, modeled after the very successful DARPA program at the Department of Defense, enacted to catalyze new breakthrough investments in energy, reduce our dependence on foreign oil, make us more energy efficient, reduce our carbon footprint. This is what ARPA-E is going to bring across. 
Because you first you have to lay down the building blocks of innovation. The first thing we looked at was to say, we've well, got to increase our investments in R&D. It's tragic where we're competing with the rest of the world if we're not investing at the same levels in research and development. We all know that. So the President made historic investments in the NSF and our other science agencies to increase that. The second building block of innovation is education. Right? What I, one reason I'm extremely proud to work with this administration is, as much as we focus on growth, we want to make sure that that growth is broad-based and shared. Small business and entrepreneurship isn't just the privy of wealthy neighborhoods and wealthy school districts. It's kids across the country can get interested in these issues. Kieran mentioned a little bit of my experience teaching entrepreneurship in a Durham, North Carolina high school. A lot of the kids in the school were struggling academically. They wanted me to come in and teach an entrepreneurship class. What I found is that entrepreneurship can be a really useful way to get kids excited about the traditional subjects. It's really a lot easier to get excited about English if you know that you have to write a business plan and it has to be coherent. It's easier to get interested in math if you know you have to understand financial statements. So I think we can never underestimate the importance of entrepreneurship education in some of the things we're doing. This administration takes that very seriously, and organizations like NIFTY, the National Foundation for Teaching Entrepreneurship, are integral in that role. We also got to focus on STEM education, and again, for everyone. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics, these are skills that everyone's going to need to have to compete in the 21st century. And the only way that the next billion dollar company is going to come in the United States, the next Facebook, the next Groupon, the next Google, is if we get our students, all American students, up to speed in science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's why the President's committed through his America Competes and other initiatives to make sure that we raise to the top of the pack. So those are the building blocks of innovation. Once you invest in innovation, you also have to think about how you're going to set down the infrastructure to move people and ideas at 21st century speeds. Idea generation is not enough. You need to have competitive markets and you need to link people. Today's innovative environment is all about collaboration. You see this. You probably work with several colleagues who aren't in Silicon Valley because of technologies that allow you to do so, right? That's the nature of innovation today. As people become more specialized, we need to collaborate across boundaries. We need to have infrastructure that lets people move, so high-speed rail. We need to have electricity, smart grid. We need to have broadband. We need to have wireless. That's why the President's Spectrum Initiative is so important. All these things are part of the innovation strategy to make sure that we're moving people and ideas, and that's the second part. So once you have the investments, once you have the infrastructure, you need the vision. Where are you going to take this country? And the President set clear priorities in clean energy, in health IT, and several other areas, and that's where he wants to take the country in terms of innovation. I think another key thing to focus on is the competitiveness argument. When we do these things, we make our nation more competitive. I spent a lot of time recently in China, in India, and Brazil. And when I come back, I'm always amazed by how big the investments are, how big the buildings are, how quick things are getting built, and the economic growth numbers. And that inspires me because those markets, by the way, are going to be important markets for U.S. producers. So as I see these countries grow, there's quite a bit of silver lining for American companies. And the President's National Export Initiative is exactly about that. Let's make sure that our small businesses can reach foreign markets because that's where a lot of the growth is. But I also think that these investments should inspire us a little bit. You know, it was 50 years ago this year that President Kennedy called for the moonshot in response to Sputnik. There's no lack of inspiration today for us to call for similar moonshots. We might even need multiple moonshots to, uh, to deal with the challenges of this generation. And on a personal note, it was also 50 years ago that my dad came to this country for the first time. And he set foot here on the day John F. Kennedy was inaugurated. And my dad had $7 in his pocket, um, a scholarship offer, and that American dream that so many people in this audience had, or their parents or grandparents. The American dream that my dad had and the call to action that John F. Kennedy, our president, had are very similar. It's the idea that we can push the boundaries, that we can create new products, business models, services, and generate opportunities that we never thought possible. We're going to need to do that to turn the corner of the economy. We're going to need each and every one of you in the audience to stand up and do it with us, and we're going to need to catalyze this all across the country. So I think that we're well positioned to answer this, and I hope you guys will join us. I look forward to your questions um, on entrepreneurship, innovation, or the economy in general, and uh, thanks for inviting me here. Thanks, Ronnie. Uh, really quickly, I just uh, I forgot to mention, we're gonna, um, we do have this uh, form um, that we have available. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask if you could just uh, raise your hand. There are individuals um, uh, in, uh, uh, around uh, in the room who can provide you with a form. If you could fill it out and then make sure we get it back so that we can um, uh, answer some of those questions during the Q&A period. Thanks a lot. 
Well, good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here, and it is, it is so exciting to feel the energy in this room, and I truly believe that the people in this room and others like you are going to turn this economy around with your ideas, with your innovation, with your passion and your energy. Um, so it's just a real pleasure to be here and to be part of this here today. We know that small business is the engine of economic growth and historically has created over or nearly two-thirds of the jobs in America. And in fact, the recent economic data that we've seen are uh, are continuing to confirm that and in the recent data shows that small businesses continue to be creating most of the jobs in this country so it's incredibly important that we continue to focus on on small business and Asian American and, and Pacific Islander entrepreneurs play an incredibly important role in this um, Asian American entrepreneurs generate nearly 300 billion dollars in revenue and employ more than two million people. And, and they're in fact growing faster and poised to hire more people than, than most other, other firms. President Obama and his team are committed to creating an environment for small business growth, innovation, and job creation. And the Small Business Administration, the other agencies that are represented here today are at the forefront of that mission. And as regional administrator for Region 9, um, as you heard, I oversee the programs and services for California, Nevada, Arizona, Hawaii, uh, Guam, and other Pacific territories. I'm pleased to say that, that our region has supported more loans to Asian American uh, businesses than any other region. In fact, twice as many as any other region in the country. And our lending to Asian American borrowers has been twice that in the past quarter than of any other quarter in history. So we, we are very pleased and proud to be part of this, um, this, this energy that, that we feel here in this room in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship among the AAPI community. So what exactly is it that SBA does and how, how can we help you? Um, we, we like to think of our programs as three C's. That's the easiest way to kind of break it down. Um, the first being capital, the second C being counseling or, or training, and the third C, contracting. And in terms of capital, you heard a little bit about the, the Recovery Act, and that was just an incredible uh, opportunity because with the Recovery Act, SBA took $730 million, and that helped to support $30 billion in loans. So you can see the leverage there by investing $730 million of taxpayer money, we were able to support $30 billion alone with the help of our, our lending partners. And so just a great investment for the American people and great investment for, for small businesses. And then of course, following on the heels of the Recovery Act, President Obama signed the Small Business Jobs Act in September of 2007. And this is, this is perhaps the most significant piece of small business legislation in over a decade. We moved very rapidly to implement this program. And um, we, since, just since the bill was signed in September, we supported more than $12 billion in, in lending to small businesses. And I'm very proud to say that California has led the way and, and is responsible for $2.2 billion of that lending out of the $12 billion total. I'd like to just give an example of how this type of uh, funding and support can, can make a difference in, in real people's lives. And so I just want to take a local example. There's a company by the name of Golden Bay Machining, which is a, a, a custom machine shop here in San Jose. And this is a story of, of four brothers um, from, from Vietnam originally, whose family left after the fall of uh, Saigon uh, with their parents and their three sisters and spent a lot of time bouncing around between different refugee camps and, in fact, eventually found themselves in the, in the Philippines and, and were not able to, to move to the U.S. because they, uh, they wanted to come as a family. So they were offered at different points to go to different countries or to split up, but they were determined to, to stick together and eventually did get that opportunity to come here and, and began a, a small business in, in 1998. Um, uh, and over time, of course, grew that business 
and from their initial investment in, in two mills, then uh, it has grown to 14 mills. And, and now um, what's, what's particularly exciting is that they were just able to get a loan with the SBA support um, for $1.5 million, and they're going to be able to buy the building that they have been cur currently leasing space in. And so, as you know, it's a pretty good time to buy property, and, and we're pleased, and along with, of course, our, our capital partner, um, and I want to make sure I, I mention their name, Capital Access Group is the company that was involved in that. And, um, you know, this is, this is a, just a great opportunity. They, they currently have about 10 employees and think that they will be able to add another six over the next couple of years. And when you think about this, just multiplied hundreds and thousands of times across the country, this is where the jobs are coming from. Um, I'd like to mention uh, a few other things about what the JOBS Act is doing to help small businesses. We have, we have permanently increased the SBA loan limits on our most popular programs from two million to five million, and increase the micro loan limit from thirty-five thousand to fifty thousand, and then of course expanded the number of businesses eligible for small business financing by increasing the size standards. Um, and you'll hear a lot about the tax cuts um, from Don, so I don't want to steal his thunder, but but that has also been just an incredibly important part of the Small Business Jobs Act. And one, one thing that I particularly want to focus on, you heard a little bit about the President's National Export Initiative already, and the JOBS Act turns SBA's Export Express pilot uh, loan program into a permanent program, thus making it easier for entrepreneurs who want to export to get that, that help in terms of their export, export loans. Um, it also provides uh, $90 million in competitive grants for states to help small business owners who want to export their products and services. And I think that's particularly relevant to the folks in this room because uh, so many of you with your, with your multi-language abilities and with your understanding of different cultures around the world, um, you, you've got a real advantage over other companies in terms of your ability to, to export. And, and it, it is just an incredible opportunity for small businesses to grow their business through, through focusing on the export market. 95% you know, of consumers live outside the, the U.S., so that's a, that's a pretty big market. Um, the second C that I want to talk quickly about is, is counseling or training. And, um, of course, here we receive, we have a number of resource partners that we work with, the small business development centers, women's business centers, and SCORE, SCORE chapters play a particularly important role here. And with the support of the SBA, these organizations can provide, in many cases, free training and free counseling um, on anything from creating a business plan to um, your ca cash flow statements to creating an exit plan. So this is just a, a great resource for, for businesses to, to, and entrepreneurs who have a great idea but don't know quite how to get there or don't know how to make their company uh, bankable when they're approaching a, a bank for, um, for funding. And I wanted to share very quickly a, another, another story about a, a woman who came um, from the Philippines to join her father. And she uh, initially was not really able to get work that inspired her. She started out busing tables and waiting tables and then eventually was promoted to uh, chief chef, but that wasn't, that still wasn't satisfying for her. And she was also frustrated by the way this restaurant um, did its business. She envisioned uh, a truly green business, a green cafe. And so she started looking um, online for, for business classes, for opportunities, and came across um, the A New America um, nonprofit organization, which is also a SBA Women's Business Center. And she signed up for their uh, 15 week certification program and was able to get the the business training that she needed to go out and actually start her business and I'm pleased to say she started that business in in May and has already won a couple of awards for both for being a you know a good sustainable green business but again you can just multiply that all across the country with whatever and all across this region with whatever ideas people have for for starting their own businesses um, the third C is, is contracting, of course, and here we help 
small businesses get access to a federal government contracts. The federal government is the largest uh, customer in the world, um, and it was responsible for, uh, well, let's see, it just actually in, in terms of the contracts that were awarded to small businesses, $97 billion last year. And so that's just a huge opportunity for, for small businesses, and we um, have a goal of making sure that 23% of all federal contracts go to small businesses and, and we help help small businesses get, get access. Um, a, a one thing I, I just want to note on, on small business contracting is that a new, a new rule is coming out. It was actually proposed last fall. This is to support women businesses in areas where they um, are traditionally un under, uh, underrepresented. So the SBA identified 80 um, industry sectors where women are underrepresented, and and now that we are just uh, the rule will become final next month, and will uh, allow federal contracting officers to set aside um, contracts for women women uh, owned businesses in those areas. Um, You'll hear more about a number of programs that will um, that are particularly helpful to high growth, high uh, impact companies in the afternoon session. And I see that my time is almost up, so I'm going to let my my colleague talk about those in the in the breakout sessions. But um, just wanted to alert you to that. So if that is your interest, if you're in the high impact, high growth area, I want to make clear that that SBA is is here to support you. We're here to support both uh, you know the high tech, clean tech, green tech, as well as the the main street mom and pop shops. So we are we are here across the board, and a um, number of SBA folks around in the audience. And I encourage you to seek out me or or any of them, um, and uh, we're we're here to help. Thank you very much. So I'll just remind folks again, if you want to um, ask a question, uh, please raise your hand and uh, we'll get you those forms and we'll make sure to get those questions. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Tom. Well, good morning, everyone. Okay, I know this is, it's, it's a little bit earlier than it is for me because I'm East Coast and I'm three hours ahead, but you all, it's, it's almost 11 o'clock, so you can do a little better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go, okay. Um, Thank you all uh, for being here. It is, it is as, as my colleagues have said, it is absolutely wonderful to see uh, such a great crowd uh, of uh, interested entrepreneurs, uh, uh, business people, uh, community folks, uh, uh, financial services uh, industry. Um, we're, we're very excited about uh, what the, the initiative is doing. As Karen mentioned, uh, I uh, was involved in the initiative uh, back during the Clinton administration when I was at the Treasury Department uh, when it was, it was kicked off. And I think it's, it's truly uh, a, a wonderful thing that we have this initiative, which is really focused on, uh, on uh, supporting the, uh, and meeting the needs of the AAPI communities. Um, last night when, uh, when I uh, was getting ready to, uh, to make my way out here, I got called into a meeting with the secretary and spent a lot of time talking with him about things and mentioned that I was coming here. Uh, and you know, he said that uh, it, you know, treasure, he expressed his regrets that he couldn't be here himself because uh, he believes that the, that the Obama administration and the Treasury Department's commitment to, uh, to this initiative and to the support of, uh, of, of growing uh, businesses and, and helping entrepreneurs is so critical to the long-term health uh, of uh, our overall economy. So uh, he, he, again, uh, apologizes for not being here himself, uh, sends his greetings to all of you. Um, now I know there, there are a number of my colleagues uh, here from uh, uh, around the administration and they've heard me do this before, so I apologize to them if, if, if they've heard it before. And you know, if any of you, aside from my colleagues, has heard this before, don't hesitate to stop. But so a, a duck walks into a federal government building. Have you heard this one? No, no. Okay. Uh, duck walks into a federal government building, and uh, you know, walks into uh, a pretty nondescript office, uh, and there's a desk, and it's filled with paper, and. There's a government bureaucrat sitting behind the desk, and uh, Duck waddles up and 
says to the bureaucrat, got any duck food? And the bureaucrat, you know, not really thinking that it's strange that a duck is actually first in the building, but now is actually talking to him, says, duck food? No, I, we're the federal government. We don't have duck food. You know, I, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go, uh, go elsewhere. And, and actually, we're not supposed to have ducks in the building. So why don't you, why don't you leave? So th the duck waddles away. Next day, the duck comes back into that same bureaucrat's office and uh, says to the bureaucrat, do you have any duck food? And the bureaucrat says, listen, y you came in here yesterday, and we didn't have duck food then, and I'm a busy man. I don't have, I don't have time for you, so you know, get out of here. Scram. So the duck waddles away again. Third day in a row, duck waddles into the bureaucrat's office and says, got any duck food? And the bureaucrat says, listen, I told you before, we don't have duck food. I am a very important government official. I do very important things to make sure that the government uh, does what it does. We keep the bureaucracy moving. Uh, so get out of here before I nail your webbed feet to the floor. So the duck, you know, scared that it's going to be stuck on the floor, waddles off. Uh, fourth day in a row, the duck comes back into the bureaucrat's office. And the bureaucrat just, you know, puts his, his head in his hands, sh shakes his head, says, the, the duck says, Got any nails? And the, the bureaucrat says, uh, no. And the duck says, got any duck food? <laughs> the reason I say that is that uh, for, for too long, people have thought that the federal government is a place that doesn't respond to the needs of people, or ducks in this case. Um, whether it's duck food or uh, ac help in growing businesses, uh, stabilizing the economy, helping to create jobs, doesn't really matter. I want to tell you that, uh, I, and I think I speak for all of my colleagues here on the panel and our friends here from the Commerce Department, from the SBA, from the Federal Reserve and other uh, agencies, uh, this, is, this is a time where the federal government, this administration, is committed to being responsive to your needs. Uh, and if we're not responsive to your needs, we're also willing to listen. Uh, we want to hear from you. If there are problems, if there's something that we aren't doing, we want to know about it so that we can try and fix it. Um, as my colleagues have, have said, there have been a number of things that we've done over the last uh, uh, several, uh, the last couple of years to get the economy going again, uh, including uh, uh, some pretty significant initiatives uh, in the last few months. And I'm, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about the Small Business Jobs Act that you've, that you've heard about. There is one person uh, without whom that uh, piece of legislation would not have passed, aside from the President. Uh, and that person, uh, just about an hour and a half ago or so, was, uh, was named Chairman of the National Economic Council for the President. That's uh, Gene Sperling. He's a good friend uh, of mine, a colleague of mine from the Treasury Department. Uh, aside from, uh, from Elizabeth's colleagues at SBA, Karen Mills, Marie Johns, Elizabeth, and her, and her other counterparts around the country, you will find no better advocate for small business, for entrepreneurship, for growth of the economy, and support for a wide range of communities than in Gene Sperling. So I think it, it says a lot about the President and about this administration that we have such a strong advocate who's now heading up uh, the, uh, the economic, National Economic Council at the White House. So uh, you know, I, I want to just give him a little shout out for, uh, because without him we wouldn't have this, this wonderful piece of legislation or the tax cuts that, that uh, Ronnie uh, and Elizabeth mentioned. Um, so there are two programs that were part of the Small Business Jobs Act that, uh, that are Treasury-related programs. One of them is the Small Business Lending Fund. This is a $30 billion capital initiative that uh, is going to support hundreds of billions of dollars of new lending all around the country. The program is aimed at providing capital to those uh, community banks around the country, the, the Main Street banks, the banks that do the majority of the lending to, uh, to small businesses, providing them with capital. So one, uh, it, pr it provides them with uh, the stability that they need uh, so that they can continue to, uh, to uh, lend because they're the ones who lent throughout uh, the recession. Uh, to expand their lending, to get to new groups, to get to new businesses all around the country. The, the program, <coughs> excuse me, provides capital to those banks, and it does it in, in such a way that those banks are able to uh, 
receive incentives for increasing their lending. If they increase their lending by 10 percent, they can get their dividend rate, the, the interest rate that they pay on that capital, all the way down to 1 percent. Uh, you will not find <clears throat> a place in this country where uh, an institution will be able to get uh, interest, uh, dividend rates uh, uh, along those lines. We, as I said, we expect that it will create hundreds of billions of dollars of new lending going forward. So we're very excited about that program. Um, <clears throat> we also have another program that has not gotten as much attention um, that uh, is, uh, it's called the State Small Business Credit Initiative. This program is a billion and a half dollar program. You say, well, the first one was a $30 billion program. This one's only a billion and a half dollars. It's a billion and a half dollars that goes directly to states, all the states that you know of uh, that are having many fiscal uh, problems, uh, and provides those states with funding to help support the innovative uh, credit support, credit enhancement programs that they already have in place, and some new ones. That billion and a half dollars, there's a minimum requirement that uh, that those states get uh, create ten dollars of new private sector lending for every uh, one dollar of federal uh, money that goes into it. So, at, at a bare minimum, that'll create fifteen billion dollars of new lending all across the country. Uh, so, we're very excited about that. California, for those who uh, who actually are from California here, California is going to get about one hundred and seventy million dollars of funding um, uh, sometime in the in the in the very near near term. Uh, we've had 48 of the 50 states have, have said that they are uh, going to apply. All of the territories uh, are going to apply. Uh, in fact, we have uh, a, a few applications that have come in, and I expect within the next few days we'll have our first funding uh, awards to those states. These programs, the, part of the state initiative, uh, do go, go to lending that a, a lot of banks can't, uh, can't do these days. Uh, because of the nature of the program, they support things like loan loss reserve programs. And you don't need to know what that means other than it gets banks to expand the credit box so you're dealing with, with small businesses that uh, may, may now have troubles because of uh, the problems with credit scores of, uh, of their owners, problems with uh, deteriorated cap collateral uh, because of, uh, of the recession. So uh, these programs will expand the credit box, get uh, dollars out to the small businesses who've had real troubles getting to uh, getting uh, loans. And I know my time is, is almost up here. I'm going to just tell you uh, again that there were eight tax cuts that were passed as part of the Small Business uh, Jobs Act. You can go to the Treasury website uh, to find out about those, to get more information about the Small Business Lending Fund, the State Small Business Credit Initiative. Go to treasury.gov. Look at, just look up small businesses. There's a section on the website, and you can find out about our programs. Quickly, I want to tell you about three other things that you should know about if you don't know already. Uh, our friends uh, at the XM Bank, I don't know if any of you have heard of that, the Export-Import Bank. They have a new program focused specifically on small business uh, partners to uh, exporters and importers. Uh, they, their program uh, helps provide additional credit to uh, to those, uh, those suppliers of the, the exporters. Um, the CDFI Fund, the Community Development Financial Institution Fund at the Treasury Department, uh, is a, really it, it's, it's a, a way to focus uh, uh, funding to uh, financial institutions that, uh, that support uh, the, the underserved communities, low-income communities all across the country. Um, I will just tell you that uh, that since 1994, there have been about $874 million in awards through that program, um, uh, and uh, over $256 million uh, uh, of awards have, have gone to Asian American communities. The final thing that I will mention is, uh, as part of the Wall Street reform uh, legislation, there was uh, a, a new uh, office created uh, that's being created at all of the federal regulatory uh, and financial agencies, Treasury, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the FDIC, the Fed, uh, the Board of Governors, the Fed all the Federal Reserve Banks, Federal H Housing Finance Authority, National, uh, the, the National Credit Union uh, Association, the SEC, and the new Consumer Financial Protection uh, Bureau. Uh, this, these offices, the Office of Minority Women uh, and Women Inclusion, are going to set standards on diversity and inclusion uh, and uh, standards on accessing uh, the opportunities at uh, all of the agencies. 
They're going to provide, uh, provide monitoring and reporting on hiring and procurement in the agencies. They're going to advise the heads of the agencies and provide outreach on uh, all of these types of issue, uh, issues all around the country. So uh, pay attention to what's going on with, with those offices. You will hear more about them. They have to be stood up by January the 20th, um, and uh, that is uh, a great way to access uh, a wide range of, of opportunities and, and programs at, at the financial, uh, financial agencies of the federal government. So I'm sorry, I've gone a little over time. And thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, so I need those questions. My, and um, uh, if we can go ahead and get those, I, I know we have. A f Great. Um, can you hand me Okay. Lots of questions. SBA, big packet right here. <laughs> so we're going to try to see. Okay, so um, very really quickly before we get started on questions, I just wanted to mention one uh, one major uh, effort uh, uh, within the administration that should not um, go unspoken, um, which is uh, uh, the president's unprecedented investment in education uh, during his administration, and 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 he knows, and he said time and time again that. Uh, Investing in the education is investing in our long-term economic growth and why that's so critically important. And I wanted to mention, I don't know how many folks are familiar with the fact that the president um, has set a 2020 goal. Do folks know that 2020 goal? No, okay. Well, the 2020 goal is to have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. And we're on our way to doing that. I mean, there's some serious investments um, within this administration, and uh, from college uh, access to affordability to infrastructure to private-public partnerships and reforming uh, K through 12. Uh, secretary Duncan, uh, who's the Secretary of Education, calls it the cradle to career agenda. And in particular, I think it's telling because right now, less than half of high school graduates from low-income families attend college, half of that number. And then about one in four low-income college students who start college full-time graduate within six years. And these facts, frankly, are unacceptable. Um, and it's also a reason why um, our administration supported the DREAM Act, which hopefully many of you are familiar with. The fact that we have 65,000 undocumented students each year who graduate from high school. So if we're gonna meet this goal in 2020, and if we're talking about long-term economic growth and investment, uh, we can talk about the R&D, the clean tech, um, but we also know that, uh, and the President feels very strongly about the fact that we um, need to make that serious investment in education. And I wanted to point out that um, we have here uh, um, with us today a senior advisor for the Undersecretary, Martha Cantor, um, who's Undersecretary in the Department of Education, Hal Plotkin, if you could just raise your hand. Hal's here, um, and, uh, and also very, uh, hope fairly well known in the community. Um, this is part of his stomping ground, earlier stomping ground. So uh, if you have any questions related to education, um, he is the man to go to. So we're going to hand over. OK, let's see. Who's the lucky person here? Um, why don't we just switch around with uh, between? Uh, uh, OK, so oh, we've got more, right? Why don't, yeah. Can you guys help me with uh, filtering some of these? OK. OK. They are sorted. Okay, this is something that I've heard quite a bit about, um, is that Asians have uh, the highest, one of the highest rates of entrepreneurship um, in the country, um, especially in California. Um, they make up uh, about 40% of the SBA loan portfolio. Um, I guess here, and is that it true in I'm region? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. 40% of the SBA loan portfolio? It's, okay. It's, well, nationally, it's about 16%. Nationally, 16 so I don't know if that's the case here in California. Yet, the, the question is when um, this person goes to the small business summits, expos, and trade shows, Asian Americans are invisible 
on the panels in the audience um, and on the issues that are being talked about um, um, within uh, um, in those arenas. And I think uh, there have been times where I've uh, received uh, concerns about uh, um, the kind of outreach. Um, I think maybe this is related to outreach within the Asian American community. And I know Region 9 may be a little bit different because of the states that you have um, under your jurisdiction. But I was wondering if, if you could just maybe talk about any maybe general efforts. I know that um, there's a lot of efforts going uh, on to, to target uh, minority businesses. So um, if maybe just really briefly, if there's anything you can touch on right. related to that. Yeah, thanks very much for the question. It's actually one of my uh, major priorities for the region is to make sure that we connect our services with markets that we're currently not connecting with. And certainly one of those is the, well, is the Asian American market. Although in, in our region, as I said, we've, we've we're sort of double, so 16% nationally, so I guess that would give us about 32% of the, the loan volume here in, in this region. Um, so I think we're doing uh, better in this region, but I think that, that we have such an opportunity. We have so many talented uh, entrepreneurs from the AAPI community that we, we should be at 40 or 50%, really. Um, and uh, so I think that the trick here is to meet people where they are. We need to understand where the disconnect is. Okay, so why aren't we doing better? We need to get out there and, and talk to folks in the community and see how we can better connect them with with services, how we can better connect them to the informal networks that help businesses succeed. Um, and that is something that, as I said, is, a, is very important to me. And it's, it's also an initiative more broadly for underserved markets in general that our, our deputy administrator has, has taken on as, as one of her uh, major priorities as well. And, and if I could just piggyback on, on that. Um, I think, you know, as I said, the, um, the Treasury Department and all of the, the banking agencies, uh, uh, the regulatory agencies, have uh, a requirement as part of the Wall Street reform uh, to do a significant amount of, uh, of outreach uh, through the, the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. Uh, in addition, the Small Business Jobs Act uh, provided requirements for us to, to do uh, additional outreach as part of the two, at least the two Treasury programs, the Small Business Lending Fund and the State Small Business Credit Initiative uh, to minority communities, to veterans, to, uh, to women-owned businesses. Um, so we, uh, you know, we take that to heart. Uh, it's not only a requirement, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's, it goes along with, with uh, the, the department's commitment to uh, finding ways to uh, ensure that, uh, that minorities and women uh, and veterans and service-disabled veteran businesses have uh, access to a wide range of, of the programs, opportunities, capital, and credit. Um, Ronnie, do you want to take the question that you? Yeah, asked? sure. Okay. So I had a question uh, about social innovation and, and entrepreneurship that I wanted to address. You know, um, as a professor at, at Duke, it was very often the students would come into my office and ask me about how to use their private sector skills to make social change. And I've seen it increase across business schools, um, in boardrooms, um, all over the world, actually. And the question I wanted to know, there's two questions related to both, sort of how do we harness these good ideas and what's the government doing? So our good colleague here, another AAPI member, Sonal Shaw, runs the Office of Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Domestic Policy Council. I work closely with her, but I strongly encourage people who are interested in this issue to follow up with her. I can uh, parlay that as well. I think there's two big questions when it comes to social innovation and entrepreneurship. We have so many entrepreneurs right now all across the country doing amazing things to solve social problems. You've heard of people like Jeffrey Canada and his Harlem Children's Zone and the amazing gains he's made in the 100 block radius in New York City. The key question, though, is if we're going to use these ideas and scale them, how are we going to make Jeffrey Canada's in 100, 100 cities across the United States? That's the challenge. That's the challenge. It's the same challenge that an entrepreneur faces with a new product. How do I scale and serve a broader market? But the issue for social entrepreneurs is there's not necessarily a great long-term financing market. How do you seek venture capital? How do you issue equity? How do you fund these operations going forward? So I think the challenge is, as a community, and this is not just a government job, I think this is a public, private, and social sector collaboration. How do we identify the best ideas? How do we scale the best ideas? And how do we institute metrics to make sure we're accomplishing our goals? And I think that's the vanguard of where social innovation and entrepreneurship is going. I think Sonal is uh, a big proponent of it. And for people who are interested, check out the Social Innovation Fund that they've launched. Um, they handed out, I believe it's $50 million in grants to promising uh, social enterprises. 
And uh, stay tuned for more work in this area because I think it's one of the most exciting things going on in the government. And I'd be happy to follow up offline with folks who are more interested in that issue. John, do you want to take one of yours? Sure. Um, th there were a number of qu uh, questions about tax-related uh, items. And rather than getting into the weeds on some of those tax questions, I'm going to do something that uh, I know a lot of people don't necessarily like to do, but it is in keeping with my joke earlier uh, and, and also our commitment to transparency. My phone number is 202-622-9939. And I'd be happy to take uh, any of your calls on those issues or other issues or uh, uh, connect you to the right person who can answer those, those questions. I do want to, one of the questions that, that we did get was, how can Treasury uh, help our lending institutions loosen their purse strings uh, by providing more loans for small business uh, expansion? Well, that's exactly what these two new programs are, are aimed uh, at doing. The Small Business Lending Fund, $30 billion of capital for financial institutions. They only get to reduce their, or, uh, reduce their, their dividend rate, their interest rate that they pay on that capital by increasing their lending. Uh, if they don't, that interest rate goes up. So uh, we think that that's going to be a, provide a significant incentive to those institutions to provide additional lending. As, as part of that, there's also a requirement that they provide an affirmative plan to, uh, as to how they're going to, uh, to provide additional credit and reach out to a wide range of communities. So we expect that, that there will be a, a, a great increase in the, the number of loans that uh, we see in uh, Asian American Pacific Islander communities as well as uh, a wide range of other communities across the country. So I um, have a question here about, uh, uh, and I decide who would want to take this question. Uh, what insight would you share to entrepreneurs um, um, about how to go about uh, getting startup funding, like where to, kind of, where to start first um, with the federal government? Because there's so many different programs that we've just been talking about. So if there was a way to kind of say this is one, two, three. Bronnie, do you have? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was actually going to say that I think SBA is a fantastic place to start. Mm -hmm. Um, a strong tradition, not just on sort of Main Street businesses, but also increasingly high growth businesses. And I think that's what's so amazing about Caramel's leadership. I think the other thing I would encourage you to do is, is stay engaged with the entrepreneurs in the administration. You'll see Anish Chopra and Todd Park later on today. And as you watch these two dynamic entrepreneurial people talk, ask yourself what kind of government we must have if these folks are thriving. These are two gentlemen who are making things happen in the government and are constantly connected with entrepreneurs. So stay engaged with the individuals as well. From the agency perspective, SBA has done a great job putting the resources, both access to credit and access to capital, um, online. So if you're interested in one or the other, I think that's the best place to start. But frankly, you know, it, the amazing sea change that I've seen is every department in the government, every agency is talking the language of entrepreneurship. We'll have an interagency meeting, and someone from Veteran Affairs will come up to me and say, you know, we have a business incubator to help vets returning from Iraq and Afghanistan start their own businesses. You'll talk to someone in the Department of Energy, and they'll have ARPA-E trying to fund and seed new innovative technologies and companies. You'll talk to someone at our federal labs who's interested in how to commercialize the great ideas that are there. Every agency across the government is talking the language of entrepreneurship, and that's why we really have to seize this moment. So I hope that one day, you know, the SBA will be still a great place to go, but you'll have a point person at each agency in the government, and hopefully your state and local, and you'll have a champion in each of those places. And I think that's already starting to happen in the federal government. So that, that's the way I look at it. Okay. Elizabeth, a couple of questions related to um, some of the challenges, um, especially in the Asian American community, related to um, a limited English proficiency, uh, and then also uh, access uh, to some of these programs if you're not a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you could elaborate about uh, uh, really who can access, what's available, um, and also are there uh, ways uh, for individuals who, uh, um, where English is not their first language, um, uh, where they might be able to find out more about resources in their, in their native language or in other ways? I'll take the, the language issue first. Okay. This is something that, that we are very sensitive to, particularly here in Region 9 with our, our very diverse population. And, and the San Francisco District Office has made a point of publishing our information in Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, Spanish, hopefully soon other, other uh, languages as well. Um, and so I encourage you to, again, there's a, maybe the SBA staff in the audience can raise their hand, but I, I'd encourage you to, to grab one of these folks and, and ask for that information because I believe a lot of those pamphlets are here 
today. And certainly, um, if you go online, uh, and in the, again, in this region, uh, San Francisco District Office would be your office. So you can go there. The uh, phone numbers are all listed. Um, I'm co-located with that office, and I've found them to be incredibly responsive, not just to me, but to, to really any um, customers that, that I or anyone else sends their way. So I encourage you to reach out to them, get the help and information you need. And, and actually, within the, the office itself, we have a number of folks who speak other languages. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind. The other issue about um, what is and isn't available to American citizens, that's a, that's a, a tougher one. And you know, certainly, the, a lot of the loan guarantee and other things are not uh, available unless you are a, you do need to be a US citizen. Um, I, you know, I, you could probably, I'm not sure, but you could probably get access to some of the counseling services if you're not a, a U.S. citizen. I know, for example, the, the Women's Business Center that I, um, that I mentioned, um, A New America, they focus entirely on, on immigrants. And so I, I have to believe that not all of their clients are, are <laughs> naturalized American citizens. Um, so I think there are resources available. and. You know, we are restricted by, by, by law in terms of what we can and can't do. Um, so I, you know, to the extent that you're not getting what you need because there's a law in the way, I would talk to, talk to your congressman or, or talk, to, talk to other folks. But it, it is, and, and talk to us too because we, you know, we want to hear, we want to be aware of the barriers that are, are standing in your, in your way. And in fact, this might be a good opportunity to, to just do a shout out for Yvonne Lee, which, who started just yesterday and she is our, our regional advocate. Um, and she, what, what her role is, is to look at um, area, uh, impediments to you being able to do the business that you, that you want to do to create small businesses, to thrive a small business. Um, and, and so if there are changes that you see out there that need to be made in, in laws or other regulations, she's, she's a good person to talk to as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Ronnie, do you want to? Yeah, sure. So I think I, I got a couple questions just in general about how you balance some of these investments that we're making with sort of long-term goals for deficit reduction. It's a big question. I mean, that's why the President set up his fiscal commission, to deal with exactly these issues. I think what the consensus is is that these investments that the President has authorized, whether it's in a broadband network to connect Americans, whether it's in smart grid to make sure we're more energy efficient, using our energy more efficiently, or high-speed rail to make sure we can transport people more quickly and support urban centers. These are all long-term investments that are going to pay off and contribute to growth in the long term. And not to make those investments now, when the time the economy is struggling, people are out of work, didn't seem right. So I think we're balancing these big investments now that are going to pay off later with certainly an eye down the road to fiscal accountability. And I think that's how the President thinks about it. But not making these investments or raising taxes on small business and middle class folks at a time like this didn't seem to be the appropriate strategy. So I think you, you balance the investments today with a long-term eye towards deficit reduction. I think that's exactly why you set up the Fiscal Commission and we make the investments that we're doing now. You know, when people come back from, from traveling abroad and they tell me about the investments being made in other countries and they ask us, you know, why don't we build things in America anymore? And part of the things we're doing as part of the agenda is educate our people, innovate with new products, and build. And that's exactly what these things are about. And that's where job growth is going to come from, and that's where economic growth and prosperity is going to come from in the long term. It doesn't have to be either or. And so that's the way I solve the, the puzzle that was posed to me. The other question was about um, R&D tax credits. I've gotten a lot of questions since I've been out in Silicon Valley, which is not surprising, about this particular uh, proposal. We're I'm working on something now related to this. So if people have specific questions um, or ways to expand this or things that might apply to their company, email me offline and we can deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. I will, I'll, I'll circulate afterwards. Okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not about I to give my number out like Don Graves. Number, I mean. <laughs> but I'll make sure Kieran circulates. So you'll get it. Do you want to take one? Of sure. Um, the, let me just piggyback a little bit on, on that first and then there, there were Two questions. Uh, this administration has, uh, as, as my colleagues have all said, is very focused on laying the foundation for long-term growth. And I think that uh, part of what we're going to be seeing over the next year or two, and, and my, my colleague Ronnie may, uh, may uh, ha have a better, a better answer than I do or may correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think over the next year or two, you're going to see that the, the foundation that we've built will begin to, uh, to uh, allow us to build uh, and, and grow, uh, grow the economy through 
uh, entrepreneurship and, and small business growth. One of the things that we've seen in the last, uh, I think it was in the last two weeks, uh, the, the business roundtable, which is the association of the CEOs of like 200 of the Fortune 500. Um, these are the bi biggest companies, not just in the U.S., but in the world. They uh, have an index, an, uh, an economic index that they track based on what they're seeing from their CEOs, how the economy is going to perform uh, long term, and also uh, what, they, what their forecast is for their employment, for their spending, uh, for the economy generally. Their, their index uh, is at the highest point uh, this past uh, quarter uh, that it's been since 2006. So it's clear to me that, that the CEOs of the biggest businesses uh, believe that we're at the cusp of, uh, of, some, uh, of real meaningful economic growth. One of the other things that we saw through, the, through that, uh, that index was that 70, I think it was 70 percent of their business, uh, of the CEOs, believe that they are going to be employ, uh, increasing their hiring and, more importantly, spending a great deal more uh, and invest, investment in uh, innovation, in, uh, in R&D, uh, and uh, uh, building their companies. So I think what you're going to see is that will have a direct impact on our nation's small businesses that now have a wide range of tools that will help them uh, take advantage of those opportunities with larger firms, and they also will have access to credit and capital. Uh, th there was one question uh, to, to uh, us uh, about a business owner who, uh, who is Muslim uh, and has a problem with interest rates. There was also a question about, um, about personal guarantees uh, and the problem with accessing credit uh, uh, when you don't have the, the type of, of collateral that they normally would like to see. Um, specifically, the, the State Small Business uh, Credit Initiative really aims at helping states uh, with innovative credit uh, uh, programs to allow for these types of, of uh, different nuances to be met. So for those firms that have had collateral deterioration, that have problems with, uh, with, their, uh, with uh, their own uh, assets, th that's what this funding actually goes to for capital access programs. I know that California has a very long, uh, a very storied and, and big uh, capital access program that, that has done a, a great job in, you know, on that. I think Michigan uh, has the granddaddy of those programs. Um, what we're really trying to do is to help the states to create these innovative uh, mechanisms to getting to dealing with these these issues that uh, it, you know, that, that a lot of businesses are facing these days. So uh, I, I'm happy to talk with with any uh, as I've said any of the uh, of you who have questions, uh, any of the the folks who I have not been able to respond to here. Uh, feel free to to give me a call. You have my number. So we're just going to we're going with one last question, Elizabeth, for you. You had talked about uh, about the programs, um, especially for women um, mm -hmm. who are under underrepresented in small business, and you mentioned 80 industries. Or, I'm just reading from here, so I don't know if that's the uh, accurate quote uh, where women are underrepresented. And uh, the uh, the qu uh, the person who writes this question wanted to know a little bit more about those industries and also um, a little bit more about the programs. Uh, and, and, and how they're going to go about improving opportunities for women entrepreneurs. Yeah, th this program is primarily in the context of government contracting. So what SBA did was to identify um, areas out there where women are under, currently underrepresented and, and identified more than 80, so that, that is correct. It's more than 80 industries. Um, and then what it does is it allows uh, a government contracting official to do a specific set aside for uh, women-owned businesses in those in those targeted industries. Um, so this is primarily around um, contracting as opposed to more generalized support. Um, but but I but I think the best thing well two things first of all we do have the proposed rule it's out there you can look on our website which is just sba.gov um, so I encourage you to to look there and you can see the details about the the proposed rule as well as the 
um, information about exactly which industries. Um, and then it, in addition, that rule should be becoming final. The target date for it to become final is February 4th. So, so look for that. They'll be coming out. And certainly around that time in early February, you'll see a whole lot of more information about the final rule. But the, but the proposed rule is up on our website now. So I encourage you to take a look if you want more details. So uh, what we're going to do is I uh, we got a lot of questions, which was really great. I was a little overwhelmed, I have to say. It's like speed reading. Um, but we're going to make sure that these questions get to the appropriate speakers. And also I wanted to mention that some of the questions are really going to be very useful in some of the workshops that are coming up, focus on exports, focus on the government contracting. So if you didn't if you didn't have your a question answered or, or you would like to get more information on the workshops, obviously going to be more uh, intimate setting where there's an opportunity uh, to, to delve more deeply into each of these issues. Um, I did want to mention also that there were some questions related to numbers of um, Asian American um, Pacific Islanders in certain industries, or even, you know, do we have numbers specifically for spe specific Islanders? Um, we've been talking a lot about Asian Americans, and, and as a part of the, uh, this initiative, the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community is very important as well. And, you know, one thing I wanted to mention that the initiative has been working on and is a part of our executive order is encouraging federal agencies to disaggregate data, uh, to foster more data collection. Um, we get these questions a lot from reporters, um, from uh, when we go into the agencies, when we're trying to make the case, which I know is very much um, uh, uh, a challenge for, for advocates um, in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community to be able to um, have numbers that shore up, that back up some of the concerns um, in their community. And, and this is um, no different when we're talking about what is the uh, um, what is the lay of the land when it comes to where Asian Americans are thriving? Where do we have challenges? What are some of the unique challenges for the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community in particular? Um, so that is something that we're working on. I have to say sometimes we're not we're not where we need to be around uh, this data collection, but just to let you know that that is a top priority for the initiative. Um, I wanted to mention that we're going to take a break, and then we're going to move into um, a number of actually five workshops, uh, uh, one on financing the next American startup company, uh, the other on government contracting and opportunities for business, the other on exporting, uh, taking your business global, one specifically on clean energy technology, and then also on healthcare IT. So there's a lot of, uh, um, uh, gonna be a lot of good conversations happening after this. Um, I also wanna thank our speakers, our panelists today, Don, Elizabeth, and um, Professor Ronnie uh, for, uh, <laughs> um, for their, uh, for the wealth of knowledge, I know they wouldn't mind maybe staying around for a few minutes if folks have some questions. I know Don has to catch a flight in about five minutes. but um, <laughs> So we have a little bit of break, mix and mingle, and we'll see you in these workshops. Thanks so much. <laughs>